welcome. Again, we're doing comments on basically the same topic we did comments on before. Well, I put out that video uh, about, you know, showing a script that I did where I uh, basically embedded a, a NES ROM into a shell script. And then lately I did a tutorial showing how to do that. So uh, I'm going to be reading the comments on the video of me explaining how to do that. So let's get started. Marcus, Marcus says, that is very cool. By the way, the second script, the one with the awk, could be simpler. You know, I love to nitpick. And he shows me a simple set command where my script, I did a set command to get the line number of where the archive starts or the ROM starts or zip file or wherever you want to call it. Um, and then I use tail to get everything after that. He does it all in just the said command. Thank you so much, because I actually looked how to do this only for a couple minutes, uh, and I tried a few different commands. And you know when you're looking for commands like that, it's, you got to know exactly what to search, and um, I was finding things on how to grab everything after an instance of something. And the first script I found, I was grabbing uh, my actual said line in the script, so I needed to find the one that starts with that, so I tried doing that, but then... I think when I did it, it was grabbing the end line character because it was getting the archive below uh, and then getting everything after that. So it was basically making my zip file start with a new line character, which messes it up. Uh, so, But I already had notes on how to do it with, our, with said and then tail, so I went with that. Uh, but that's exactly what you showed in this comment here is exactly what I was trying to do. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. As far as formatting uh, code in the comments on YouTube, I don't think you can. That's what Pastebin is for or some other service similar to that. Let's see the next comment. That's actually pretty cool. A game on pace spin. By the way, Fort, uh, which is the name of my desktop computer, um, which is this whole thing where I have Fort and then my server's Rook and uh, my goats were all those names, which is actually a chess reference, but it's actually a reference to old Punisher comics from the 80s and early 90s where Microchip and Frank Castle would talk to each other in newspapers and whatnot and use, and he was Charles Fort. Anyway, little side note there. Uh, that's why my computer's named no, uh, Fort, because I like naming things after stuff like that, and I'm a huge Punisher fan. Anyway, uh, yeah, pretty cool. Really, it would be really cool if I embedded everything into the script, um, including the emulator, which could be done. Again, I don't know the um, character limit on Pastebin, so I might run out of space there. But, uh, but yeah, thank you. Again, this is just to play around, um, and there's a lot of reasons why... You probably wouldn't actually do this for something like this, but having being able to embed stuff into a script is very useful. So thank you. Uh, next comment. Escalating the security question. Do you trust that ROM not to contain any exploits uh, for the emulator it's running on? And I replied to this, and I'm about to give you the basic concept of the reply I gave, but then he replied after that that he was partially joking. But to answer that question, uh, yeah, it's not 100% secure. So... Uh, I'm pretty sure, I saw an article, and I doubt I read the whole thing, but basically, I think it was within the last year or two, uh, someone was able to write a ROM, and I don't remember if it was for a main system or an NES system, but it was able to uh, break out of the emulator. Uh, so that could definitely be a possibility. I always thought that could be a possibility, but I'd never heard anyone doing it. So I think it's unlikely in most cases. Again, I didn't read the article, so I don't know. If it was emulator specific, it was against one particular emulator. If that emulator has been patched, uh, I would assume that if it breaks out of the emulator, it now has whatever um, rights that that user has. Uh, and so, what target did it, did it, you know, what system did it target? Mac, Windows, Linux, Android, because they all have, you know, they all have ROM. But really, once you break out of the emulator, it doesn't matter as long as you take into account what it's for. So, Theoretically, if you could break out of the emulator, you can now check what operating system is this, run this function, you know, as an attack. That being said, that's a modified ROM. That's a ROM that either someone created from scratch or modified an NES ROM, or I, again, I don't even know if it was an NES ROM. Um, if, but an actual ROM from the 80s, obviously, or 90s or whatever, isn't going to do that because they weren't expecting people to have emulators. So it's not like I'm going to rip a game from an actual cartridge that existed 20, 30 years ago, and it's going to attack my system now. This is something that someone's modified, um, which, uh, again, I don't know the details. Uh, seems very um, low level for me, uh, which is meaning that the person that did this is very advanced, but that doesn't mean he can, couldn't make it easier for other people. Again, I don't know if it was emulator specific, what type of ROM it was, but it's definitely a possibility. Definitely, definitely, you could download a ROM, and there's a possibility that it could break out of the emulator and attack your system. It's just highly unlikely. Um, again, as I said in the last video, 
what you decide to run on your system is up to you. You know, uh, my view is pretty much don't trust anything. I very rarely trust anything. And when you're unsure, uh, actually someone commented on my other video and I commented back, um, that basically that's what virtual machines are for. Uh, virtual machines, or if you have a machine like I have my, my laptop here, which is just for fun, you know, you can pull the hard drive out of that and then just use a live CD or a live USB. I, do you call them? I always call them live CDs, then live DVDs. Now that, you know, now they're on flash drives, so you call them live systems, live USBs, but, but the image can also work. That's confusing. Anyway, so here's a question. I should have been clearer in the tutorial. Does echoing a bunch of stuff into a zip file, such as you did two different times in the video, and then he gives the example that I have the ROM and I'm decoding it from Base64 into a zip file, actually zip the data? Or is it just an ordinary binary file that arbitrarily has a zip extension? Is having a zip extension all that is required for a file to recognize a zip file? Let's work through this backwards. Extensions mean pretty much nothing to the computer. Most time extensions are there just for the user so that you know this is a zip file, so that you know that this is a text file, that you know this is a PNG file. Uh, depending on how the application that's using that uh, reads it, some are particular about zip files. So if you use, I'm pretty sure if you use the standard unzip application that you'll find in your repositories, if the file does not have a .zip extension, it's going to go, I don't know what this is, and I don't know why, because most other uh, extraction, you know, like, um, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, 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 tar files, which isn't a compression, but it's, it's a package. It's like, they don't care what the extension is. And it really doesn't matter. That's why you have the file command. If you run file in the name of a file, it's going to tell you what type of file it is because the very first part of any file will tell you what type of file it is. The computer, in most cases, does not care about the extension. Uh, it might use the extension as a quick way to know what application to open, but if you open up most image files, will open up any image regardless of what the extension is. But then I've also had image viewing applications that if it's a PNG and if the extension is JPEG, it's going to go. Uh, so it all depends on how the user writes it. Uh, going a little bit farther, no, just uh, echoing or catting stuff into a file does not make it a zip file because there's actually compression on a zip file. Now you could echo a bunch of files into one file or cat a bunch of files into one file and then somehow separate them out later. Um, but that's not a zip file. Uh, so no, doing that does not. The thing is, and I should have been clear about this, most of the time when you get a ROM file for an NES system, it comes in a zip file. Inside that zip file is a .NES file, which is the actual ROM file. But most emulators, if not all emulators for the NES system, will just, if you give it the zip file, it knows to look inside and find the NES file. But I'm pretty sure if you extract the NES file, it also knows how to play those. In this particular case, the ROM file already was inside a zip file and the emulator knows how to read it. So I'm just dumping the zip file. I'm not actually zipping anything. It's already a zip file to answer that question. This question, Michael asks, why not just use apt image? And uh, in my response to this in the comments, I, I, I kind of yelled at him. But in a jokingly way, I hope that that's clear, probably not. <laughs> um, uh, my first response to that is, because that's not what this tutorial is about, and I've complained about this before, and I've talked to other uh, YouTubers uh, who do similar type tutorials. Uh, I believe Luke Smith, when I was talking to him, or he commented on one of my videos where I talked about this, about how I'll do a tutorial on something, and then someone will come and say, why did you do it this way, not use this program, for example. I know that I've done tutorials on GIMP, and I'll have comments on, why didn't you use Inkscape? Or Inkscape would be a better option for this. And the reason is because I'm showing you how to do it in GIMP. That is what the tutorial is about, is accomplishing this task in GIMP. Uh, and my response to him was, that's like going to a Python tutorial and be like, why didn't you do it in Perl? Because I'm trying to show you how to do it in Python. So in this case, why not use an apt image? Well, number one, that wasn't the point of this tutorial. The point of the tutorial was to do this in the shell script. Secondly, the other point of my, of my tutorial in this project was to, and I said this multiple times in the video, to make a plain text thing that could be posted on Pastebin and contain the, uh, the game, or at least the ROM. It doesn't contain the emulator, but it contains the ROM. Pretty sure you can't do that with an apt image because it's going to be a binary file. I would then have to convert that to Base64 and put that into a shell script, which is just uh, silliness. We're now going in circles. Uh, beyond that, my next point of that is I know almost nothing about apt images or Docker images, if you call them images, or snap packs. And why do I not know much about them? Because I 
pretty sure I understand the basic concept of what they are, and I hate the idea. I think the concept is just, I don't want to say idiotic, because that's a little extreme. And there are cases where you want to do something like that, but in most cases, I think the concept of packages like that are a bad idea. And I could do a whole video on that, and maybe I will. The basic concept is we have package managers that, re that will pull down packages and any um, dependencies for it. These image uh, files uh, basically, in a very loose sense, make kind of like a virtual environment, and they have all these all the dependencies. So basically, if you have a Python script, from my understanding, if you're making some sort of image like this, a Docker app image, and correct me if I'm wrong, I have a Python script. Instead of just installing the Python script and any modules that are needed, it's going to package up the Python script, any modules that are needed, Python, any dependencies that any of those things need, all in one package. So now I now you have that, and now you download another program, and instead of going, oh, these are already installed on my system, it's going to package them all again, making the package bigger, making, uh, it's just a horrible idea. <laughs> it's great for, you know, preservation, you know, 10 years from now, having everything packaged together, that way, you know, you have one file. But right now, for current usage, that's what my package manager is designed for. That's why we have linked libraries, so you don't have repeat stuff. And I get storage space is, you know, cheap these days, but that isn't an excuse to be sloppy about how you package things or how you code things. And you can completely disagree. You could not care at all. Um, but in my thought, you know, in this case, I did a shell script, you know, that's, you know, very, very small, using bash, which is probably installed on your system already, or really, uh, I'm not sure if my script is even bash specific, it probably could have used almost any shell. But if I was to put it in an app image, now I'm packaging all this stuff that's already on my system just for a small little script. And again, the whole embedding the ROM into the script isn't a great idea. It was just playing around, experimenting to see, it, you know, would this work? Could I post this on Pastebin? Again, I wanted to see if I could put something like that and fit in the, in the character limit of Pastebin, which I still, I should look up and see what it is. So that's my answer to that. And again, I kind of, all capitals, because that's not what this tutorial is about in the comments. And yeah, I am yelling at the guy, um, but in a joking way, just because it, it is a little obnoxious to go to a tutorial on a particular subject and say, why did you do a tutorial on this subject and not this subject? Because that's not what this tutorial is about. Anyway, I do thank you for watching, and I hope that you have a great day.